and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I am a nurse practitioner and much of what I put here on this YouTube channel is content related to being a nurse practitioner or in the nursing community or in working in healthcare in general. I do sprinkle in some other personal stuff here and there, but generally that's the content that you're gonna see. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. I'm so happy and thankful to have you guys here. Hopefully you don't mind this fan on me. I'm currently pregnant and like always a furnace, so I have it on low. Hopefully it's not too distracting, but if you see my hair blowing in the wind, that is why I have a fan like directly on me right now. Anyway, so for today's video, I'm gonna be discussing something really important, not very lighthearted actually. I'm gonna be discussing recognizing child abuse or child neglect and what you should do as a healthcare professional. And so a little backstory as to why I thought I wanted to discuss this with you guys. Of course it's important and relevant regardless, but I actually had a situation working in the urgent care that made me realize just how important it is to be familiar with what to do when you have these situations arise. And so just a little bit of a backstory. I had a mother bring in a 10 month old child that needed to have some legal paperwork done for child protective services. She needed to have a healthcare professional evaluate her child and look for any signs of child abuse and she needed to have it done that day for her social worker. And apparently she wasn't able to get into the pediatrician or primary care and so she came to the urgent care and presented me with information and I was kind of caught off guard, definitely something that I didn't prepare for or have ever experienced before. I don't feel like I really had a lot of education other than like common sense and what I've seen in the ER, but I really didn't know what I was expected to do working in the urgent care as a nurse practitioner being presented with this. And so that's what made me think about this and why I thought it'd be just so important to discuss with you guys. So in case you know, you're ever confronted with something like this, you have a little bit of a better idea of how to approach the situation. What I did do in this circumstance was I took a moment, I went back to my office, you know, I reviewed some literature, I discussed with my overseeing physician, I even contacted the child's pediatrician to kind of make sure that everybody was on board and knew that child protective services were you know, involved and making sure that I wasn't stepping over any boundaries. And I really, of course, ultimately wanted to make sure that I was doing what was best for the child and making sure that I was protecting the child and just ultimately doing what was best for the child and their, their well-being. I'll be talking about how to recognize abuse or neglect, what you need to do as a healthcare professional, because as you know, we are mandated by law to report if we suspect abuse and you know your documentation and everything that kind of goes with it. So without further delay, let's just get into the content. All right, so looking at the statistics, they're really quite alarming. So the World Health Organization, they estimate that 13% of 1.2 million deaths that occur worldwide in children less than 15 years of age are directly related to child abuse and or neglect. And so as healthcare professionals, it's our duty to report any suspicions that we have of child abuse that may be occurring. So first, why don't we look at some factors that put a child at an increased risk for abuse. There are many, um, however, these should never be used as the only factor for raising suspicions but instead they just help you to paint a larger picture and again, of course, identify these at-risk populations. So some risk factors include, but they're not limited to, children with learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities or other handicaps, children with conduct disorders or mental health disorders, children with ADHD, children who are unplanned or are unwanted, children with an unrelated adolescent male residing in the home, children with an unrelated adult male care caregiver in the home, uh, children that reside in a home with domestic violence or animal cruelty present, children that live in poverty, children that live with young or single parents, children that live with caregivers who suffer from either substance abuse or alcohol abuse, children that live with caregivers who have poorly managed mental health illnesses, and then children that live with caregivers who were also abused as children. And so you can see there are a lot of risk factors here. Again, like I said, this isn't everything. There are other risk factors and they're not a sole reason for you to assume abuse is occurring, but they definitely can give you some insight and a bigger picture as to what might be going on with your patient. 
All right, so now let's discuss how we would approach these potential encounters. And so this is really kind of the heart of the discussion. So first and foremost, the child's health is obviously priority here. So before any questioning is done, the child needs to be stable. This is common sense, but it's really important to emphasize that the child needs to be stabilized and then we determine if abuse is a factor. So according to the literature, if a child presents with nonspecific findings, for example, if there's altered mental status, if they have vomiting, or if they have generalized pain that doesn't have a clear medical origin, right? Doesn't have a clear cause for what is causing this to be occurring, then trauma or abuse should be considered in your differential. If trauma is an obvious component for the patient's presenting injury, then it's very important that you get a detailed description of the event. And if there are multiple caregivers present, ideally it would be um, it would be ideal if you could get and interview them separately to see that their stories kind of coincide. Uh, additionally, if trauma is the cause for injury, a thorough exam is imperative, and this should take place with specific attention to a few different areas. So one, the mouth. So for example, that frenulum, we're looking for any frenulum tears, any unexplained teeth, palate or lip injuries. Um, we should be looking at injuries to the ears or to the scalp, the buttocks, the genital region, and then any body folds present, specifically looking at the folds of the neck, but all body folds should be included and we should be making special attention to these areas. If trauma or injury is identified on your exam, it's imperative that you assess further for signs that have been shown to be highly correlated with abuse injuries. And so, for example, does the injury represent a shape or pattern that indicates intentional abuse? So, for example, does it look like there was a tool used? Do they have cord marks or belt marks? slap marks or bite marks? Is there evidence of intentional burns? And so what you would be looking for with intentional burns would be um, burns that are have sharply demarcated edges, uh, evidence of cigarette burns, so those small circular burns, um, burns to the posterior trunk, buttocks or genitals, or burns that extend over 20% of the body surface area. All of those can indicate that these are intentional burns. Also bruising, this is something to look at. So bruising is common, right? It's the most common form of unintentional and intentional injuries. And so there are certain characteristics that could um, indicate abuse associated with that bruising. And so that's bruising in children less than six months of age, if there's more than one bruise in a pre-mobile infant or more than two bruises in a crawling infant. Also bruises that are located on the torso, buttocks, ear, neck, jaw, cheek, or eyelid. And so obviously you're looking at the whole picture here. Do they have some kind of high traumatic injury or does the story not match with the um, evidence of the injury that you're looking at? And so these are just something to keep in the back of your mind. Also, uh, does the story provided match the present injury? So kind of like what I was saying. Uh, does it match the history that they're giving with the seriousness of the injury? Are there multiple injuries present in various stages of healing? That's another red flag for you guys. And then finally, there are specific injuries that have a high correlation with physical abuse. So a subdural hematoma, rib fractures, uh, femur fractures in non-ambulatory children, um, visceral injuries, so like a pancreatic injury, small bowel injury, anything like that, if it's not, again, explained by some accidental high energy blow to the abdomen. So an example would be like if they were in a uh, motor vehicle crash, then that would explain that type of injury. Um, also, again, multiple fractures in various stages of healing. And then finally, immersion burns. And so immersion burns, again, would be um, evident by 
burns that have those sharply demarcated edges. And so all of these are going to be red flags and stuff that you should be really paying attention to when you're doing your thorough exam. Um, additionally, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they recommend evaluating for abuse if any of these following are present as well. And so they really kind of coincide with that previous slide, but I just want to emphasize. So either the caregiver or the patient denies you know, a history of trauma despite there being a presence of severe injury. So again, that just means, you know, the, the history doesn't match up with the severity of the injury. Um, and that's exactly what the next line says. History does not correlate with degree of injury. So that's always going to be a huge red flag in our mind. Um, if there's a delay in seeking care or treatment, that's another red flag. Um, if there's a severe injury and it's blamed on either the patient, other children, or pets, that should be alarming to us. And then finally, if there are conflicting stories being presented from other persons that might have been present when the event occurred, or if the caregiver or uh, parent changes their story when they're retelling it, all of those should sort of like set off a red flag in our mind that maybe there is abuse occurring. In general, there should be a low threshold for consulting with a multidisciplinary child abuse team. And so what that means it usually includes something like a social worker or a nurse or another healthcare professional and a child abuse special, specialist. And then ultimately, any suspicions that you have should be reported. In the event that you do need to report potential abuse or neglect to Child Protective Services, um, the parents or the legal guardians should be notified. And so it's important that you protect the child and yourself in these situations. So arranging some sort of support before talking with these caregivers is really imperative. So for example, either having security or police officers present, that can help with uh, protecting you and the patient. But you really wanna have some kind of support system in place. It can be a very difficult conversation to have, and so it's important to approach the conversation very calmly in a non-accusatory manner. Um, the conversation it should be solely focused on the safety and the well-being of the child. So an example for how to approach the conversation was provided in Up to Date, and I think it was uh, really well worded. And I just I like when people give me precise examples of how to approach things, especially when it's these type of situations that, you know, can be very, very difficult to discuss. So there's a couple quotes here. I put the, the link from the article that I took it from too. But so the first quote is, we have identified the following concerning findings. And then you would fill in the blank of those concerning findings. And then we find injuries like these that are not easily explained. We report to CPS to make sure that your child is safe. Always bringing it back to the safety of the child. Um, and then also you can add on there too that you are required to report by law. It is in your job description to report any sus suspicions of abuse or neglect by law. And so you can add that in there as well. Again, I know this would be a difficult conversation, so I would kind of tuck those quotes in like a little, on maybe a piece of paper or in the back of your mind if you have good memory, because I think it just makes it easier to kind of carry on the conversation. But again, of course, remember too, that you have some kind of support system in place that one, they don't become physically violent with you and that they don't try to flee with the child. And so always have someone there to support and protect you and the child. And just for your reference, I think it's good to know there are other professionals that are required by law to report uh, reasonable, reasonable suspicion for abuse or neglect. So other professionals include mental health professionals, educators, child care providers, uh, social service providers, and then law enforcement as well. And so like I said, it's within your scope of practice and you are required by law to report any reasonable suspicion for abuse or neglect. And in the circumstance where you do believe that this is occurring, the safety of the child and the need for rep reporting supersedes confidentiality. And so if you do need to make a report, I put on here on the slide, um, you can either call your state's Child Protective Services, CPS, or you can call Child Help, and the number is there for you. It's one 800 for a child or 1-800-422-4453. 
and you can just look this up on Google and it's really easy to find out where to contact but just for your reference those are provided on the slide. All right, and then lastly, it's imperative that you are thorough in your documenting. And so if there are any specific legal forms that you are completing, you know, you should make copies of those and they should be filed within the patient's chart. And then your report, it really needs to contain some vital information. And so there's some stuff here listed that you should always include. Um, it's not limited to, but you should definitely include in your report. So your report, one, it should be typed. It shouldn't be handwritten. And then you should also avoid any kind of confusing language or medical jargon because there can be many different specialties reading these, um, reading your report, not always healthcare professionals. And so you want to really kind of use more of like layman terms. Uh, and again, like avoiding that medical jargon. But your report should include, and I said again, not limited to, but the name, age, and sex of the child or children, the name and address of the parent or guardian, a detailed history of the injury as provided by the caregiver, and that's including but not limited to the mechanism of injury, um, the setting where the alleged abuse or neglect took place, any discrepancies between the report given, uh, symptoms that the child experienced before and after the event, and then ultimately the disposition of the child. Any relevant psychosocial factors. So examples of this would be any mental health problems of the caregiver, any previous CPS involvement or reported abuse, if there's any substance abuse or alcohol abuse present, physical exam findings that you, so exam findings that you saw um, while you were doing your head to toe, on the child and then any procedures that you did perform like if you had to perform x-ray all of that should be included um, photographs this is a huge part when filing a complaint for child abuse so multiple photographs should be taken they should be clear with good lighting time and date should be included with the photographs uh, if you're looking at you know bruising or different injuries it's important too to have some kind of reference tool that shows you know the size of injury so you could have a ruler or some sort of measurement so you're depicting the accurate size of the injury and then finally your report should include you know a clear explanation of why you suspect abuse or neglect is occurring essentially the more detailed the better and finally another really important point here that i didn't include yet was you should take immediate action to prevent the alleged abuser from accessing this child's chart. A lot of times, you know, caregivers may have access to the child's chart like through a portal or something like that. But while an ongoing child welfare investigation is taking place, they should not have access to the child's chart or medical records. And again, of course, that's just to protect the child. All right, so again, just to kind of close out this video, these are really difficult encounters, no matter which way you spin it. Uh, it's just kind of a difficult situation or circumstance to be in. I think the best thing that you can do is just prepare yourself if and when this circumstance does arrive. Ultimately, your job is to protect your patient. And so sometimes advocating for our patients can feel uncomfortable, but that is your job and your role as a healthcare professional. And so you should never feel afraid to speak up or advocate for your patient if you think that there's abuse or neglect occurring because ultimately at the end of the day you could save a child's life and so it's really important. Hopefully you feel like you took a little something away from this presentation and you feel a little bit more equipped if and when, like I said, you do encounter this type of circumstance. If you have anything to add to the discussion, I'd love to read it in the comments down below. Otherwise, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, I wish you guys nothing but the best. All right, I'll talk to you soon.